Counter Rev Audio. April 2021. The Managerial Revolution, What is Happening in the World, by James Burnham. This edition published in 2019 by Endeavor Media Limited. Chapter 1. The Problem. During the course of the Second World War, which began on September 1, 1939, Growing numbers of persons came to the conclusion that this war could not be adequately understood in the usual military and diplomatic terms. Of course, each participant in every big war is careful to explain that it fights, not for any vulgar purpose of mere conquest, but for liberty, justice, God, and the future of mankind. The Second World War is no exception to this general rule which seems to express a deep need of man's moral nature when confronted with the task of mutual slaughter. Nevertheless, with all allowances for the general rule, there still remains, on the part of trained and intelligent as well as casual observers, the conviction that this war is not an ordinary war. The difference has been stated by some in calling the war a revolution, more particularly, a social revolution. For example, the well-known writer, Quincy Howe, in his radio commentaries insisted time after time on such an interpretation. Germany, he kept repeating, is not merely sending a remarkably organized military machine across its borders. Her military machine is the carrier of a social revolution which is transforming the social system on the European continent. The same point was made in numerous dispatches from Otto Toiliskas after his expulsion from Germany, where he had been stationed for many years as chief correspondent of the New York Times. I mention these two men not because their opinion was exceptional but rather because they conspicuously and consistently upheld a view which has come to be shared by so many others. However, when we examine what such observers have said and written, we discover that, though they have been firm in their insistence that the Second World War is a social revolution, they have been by no means clear in describing what kind of revolution it is, what it consists of, where it is leading, what type of society will emerge from it. We must be careful not to permit historical judgment to be distorted by the staggering emotional impact of the war itself. If a major social revolution is now in fact occurring, the war is subordinate to the revolution, not the other way around. The war in the final analysis, and future wars, is an episode in the revolution. We cannot understand the revolution by restricting our analysis to the war, we must understand the war as a phase in the development of the revolution. Moreover, the role of Germany in the revolution, if it is a revolution, should not be exaggerated. The modern world is interlocked by myriad technological, economic, and cultural chains. The social forces which have been dramatically operative within Germany have not stopped at the Reich's national boundaries. If they came to so startling a head in Germany, this does not mean that they have not been driving steadily beneath the surface, and not so far beneath, in other nations, in all other nations for that matter. For us who live in the United States, it is the United States that is our most natural first interest. The outworn fallacies of the belief in the military isolation of the United States from the rest of the world are not one-tenth so grave as the fallacies of the belief in our social isolation. It is by no means obvious what we mean when we speak of a social revolution, especially when we try to distinguish a social revolution from a merely military or political revolution. Several conflicting definitions have been attempted, as a rule accompanying special and conflicting theories of history, of which the definitions are a part. It seems, however, possible to describe the chief constituents of what can intelligibly be meant by a social revolution without committing ourselves in advance to any special theory. These chief constituents seem to be three. 1. There takes place a drastic change in the most important social, economic and political, institutions. The system of property relations, the forms under which economic production is carried on, the legal structure, the type of political organization and regime, are all so sharply altered that we feel compelled to call them different in kind, not merely modified in degree. Medieval, feudal, property relations, modes of economic production, law, political organization are all replaced by modern, bourgeois or capitalist, property relations, modes of production, law, and political organization. During the course of the revolution it often happens that the old institutions are quite literally smashed to pieces, with new institutions developing to perform analogous functions in the new society. 2. 
along with the changes in social institutions there go more or less parallel changes in cultural institutions and in the dominant beliefs which man hold about man's place in the world and the universe. This cultural shift is plainly seen in the transition from feudal to modern capitalist society, both in the reorganization of the form and place of such institutions as the church and the schools, and in the complete alteration of the general view of the world, of life, and of man which took place during the Renaissance. 3. Finally, we observe a change in the group of men which holds the top positions, which controls the greater part of power and privilege in society. To the social dominance of feudal lords, with their vassals and fiefs, succeeds the social dominance of industrialists and bankers, with their monetary wealth, their factories and wage workers. In this conception there is a certain arbitrariness. The fact is that social and cultural institutions, beliefs, and relationships of social power always change, are subject to a continuous modification. It is impossible to draw an exact temporal line dividing one type of society from another. What is important is not so much the fact of change, which is always present in history, as the rate of change. In some periods the rate of social change is far more rapid than in others. Whatever one's professed theory of history, it can hardly be denied that the rate of change of social institutions, beliefs, and relative power of various social groups was incomparably higher in, say, the two centuries from 1400 to 1600 than in the six centuries preceding 1400, that, indeed, there was a much greater total change in those two centuries than there had been during the six centuries from 800 to 1400. What we seem to mean by a social revolution is identical with such a period of maximum rate of change. We all recognize the society that prevailed before such a period as a different type from that which is consolidated after it. Historians differ widely about when the modern era began, but they all unite in making a sharp distinction between medieval and modern society. To say that a social revolution is occurring at the present time is, then, equivalent to saying that the present is a period characterized by a very rapid rate of social change, that it is a period of transition from one type of society, that type which has prevailed from, roughly, the 15th century to the early part of the 20th, to a new and different type of society. For centuries, men's activities are worked out within a given, more or less stable, framework of social and cultural institutions, changes take place, but not to such an extent as to alter the basic framework. Occasionally, in human history, the changes take place so rapidly and are so drastic in extent that the framework itself is shattered and a new one takes its place. The problem of this book is as follows, I am going to assume the general conception of a social revolution which I have just briefly stated. I am going to assume further, though not without evidence to back up this assumption, that the present is in fact a period of social revolution, of transition from one type of society to another. With the help of these assumptions, I shall present a theory, which I call the theory of the managerial revolution which is able to explain this transition and to predict the type of society in which the transition will eventuate. To present this theory is the problem, and the only problem, of this book. I do not wish to pretend that this theory is a startling and personal innovation. On the contrary, when, during the past years, I have presented it in lectures or conversation, I am generally told, why, that is just what I have been thinking lately, or, that is what I was telling so and so only a few days ago. This reaction has seemed to me a reason not for dropping the theory as trivial or banal but rather for bringing it as fully and explicitly as possible into the light so that it may be examined publicly and critically, to be rejected, accepted, or suitably modified as the evidence for and against it may demand. During the past 20 years many elements of the theory have been included in various articles and books, to which I must acknowledge a general indebtedness without being able to name any particular one by which I have been specially influenced. What is new in the outline, it is hardly more than that, which will follow as the name given to the theory, which is not unimportant, the number of diverse historical factors which are synthesized under it, the elimination of assumptions which have heretofore obscured its significance, and the manner of presentation. With reference to the last, another word is necessary. I am not writing a program of social reform, nor am I making any moral judgment whatever on the subject with which I am dealing. As I have stated, I am concerned exclusively with the attempt to elaborate a descriptive theory able to explain the character of the present period of social transition and to predict, at least in general, its outcome. I am not concerned, in this book at any rate, 
with whether the facts indicated by this theory are good or bad, just or unjust, desirable or undesirable, but simply with whether the theory is true or false on the basis of the evidence now at our disposal. This warning, I know, will not be enough to prevent many who read this book from attributing to it a program and a morality. The elimination of such considerations is extremely rare in what is written about history, society, and politics. In these fields we are, perhaps understandably, more anxious for salvation than for knowledge, but experience ought to teach us that genuine salvation is possible only on the foundation of knowledge. And, though this book contains no program and no morality, if the theory which it puts forward is true, or partly true, no intelligent program or social morality is possible without an understanding of the theory. Chapter 2. The World We Lived In We live, then, in a period of rapid transition from one type or structure of society to another type. But, before answering our central problem of the world tomorrow, we must have a coherent idea of the world yesterday. We cannot really understand where we are going unless we have at least some notion of where we start from. What were the chief characteristics of the modern world, the type of society usually referred to as capitalist or bourgeois, which was dominant from the end of the Middle Ages until, let us say in order to fix a date, 1914, the beginning of the First World War? In the attempt to describe the chief characteristics of capitalist society, or any society, we are met at once with certain difficulties. What shall we describe? We cannot describe everything, all the books ever written are not long enough for that. Whatever facts we select may seem arbitrarily selected. Nevertheless, we have already a guide to the particular kind of arbitrariness that is relevant to our purpose. Our problem is concerned with social revolution, and social revolution, according to the conception which has been outlined, is a matter of the most important economic and political institutions, widespread cultural institutions and beliefs, and ruling groups or classes. When these change drastically, the type of society has changed, and a revolution has occurred. It is modern or capitalist society in terms of these, then, that must be described. We do not have to include an account of the thousands of other features of modern society which might be relevant to some different purpose. There is a second arbitrariness as well. In describing capitalist society, not only do we select out only a few institutional features, but we limit our survey to only a certain, minor, percentage of the Earth's surface and a certain, minor, percentage of the Earth's population. It might seem rather narrowly conceited for us to draw our conception of what the modern world has been like almost exclusively from a few European nations and the United States. There are more territory and more people, after all, in Asia, Africa, and South America. However, this arbitrariness, too, can be motivated. It is, indeed, a sufficient motivation to point out that our special problem is to discover what is happening, and is going to happen, to the kind of society that has prevailed during modern times in such nations as England, the United States, France, and Germany, not the kind of society that may have existed in central India or China or Africa. Even apart from this, however, it is not unreasonable to define modern society in terms of the institutions of these nations. It is they that have been the most powerful influences in post-medieval times, not only within their own boundaries, but on a world scale. Their institutions have profoundly affected those of Asia, Africa, and South America, whereas the reverse is not true, the institutions indigenous to those vast continents have had no comparable effect on the great modern powers. It is fairly clear what nations and peoples we must pay most attention to when trying to sum up the nature of modern capitalist society. England with its empire comes first on all counts. Prior to the rise of England, France deserves special notice for an earlier approximation to certain key modern political forms, and the Italian city-states, the cities of the Germanic Hansa, leagues, and later the cities of the lowlands for crucial economic developments. France gets renewed importance in the late 18th century, and, in the 19th, France and England are joined by the United States and Germany, and, in lesser roles, Russia, Italy, and Japan. The modern world has been the world of these nations, not of Afghanistan or Nicaragua or Mongolia. 1. Modern capitalist society has been characterized by a typical mode of economy. The mode of economy has gone through a number of major phases and transformations, has been more fluid and changing than any other economy known to history, 
but throughout these transformations certain decisive features have persisted. All of these features are sharply different from the outstanding features of feudal economy, which preceded capitalist economy and out of which capitalist economy evolved. Among the most important and typical of them may be listed the following. 1. Production in capitalist economy is commodity production. Thousands of diverse goods are turned out by the processes of production, diverse in their nature and suited to the fulfillment of thousands of different human needs. Some can warm us, some decorate us, some feed us, some amuse us, and so on. But in capitalist economy all of these diverse goods can be directly compared with each other in terms of an abstract property, sometimes called their exchange value represented either exactly or approximately, depending upon the economic theory which analyzes the phenomenon, by their monetary price. Products looked at from the point of view, not of those qualities whereby they can satisfy specific needs, but of exchange value, in which respect all products are the same in kind and differ only in quantity, are what is meant by commodities. All things appear on the capitalist market as commodities, everything, thus, shoes and statues and labor and houses and brains and gold, there receives a monetary value and can, through monetary symbols, go through the multitudinous operations of which money is capable. All societies, except the most primitive, have produced some of their goods as commodities. But in every society except the capitalist, and very notably in the feudal society which preceded capitalism, commodities have made up a very small segment of total production. In the first place, in other societies by far the greater proportion of goods was produced for use by the immediate producers, did not enter into exchange at all, and therefore had no occasion for functioning as commodities. You cannot eat or wear exchange value or money, not the price of goods but the qualities that enable them to satisfy specific needs are all that enters into subsistence production. But even where goods entered into exchange in other societies, again notably in feudal society, they ordinarily did not do so as commodities. Exchange for the most part in the Middle Ages was not for money or through the intermediary of money but in kind, and there, too, what interested the buying or selling peasant was not the price he could get or would have to pay but whether he had a surplus of one kind of goods capable of satisfying one kind of need that he could trade for something else satisfying some other need. 2. The all-important, all-pervasive role of money as an equally obvious feature of capitalist economy, is indeed a necessary consequence of commodity production. Money is not an invention of capitalism, it has been present in most other societies, but in none has it played a part in any way comparable to what capitalism assigns it. The difference is readily enough shown by the fact that almost all of the complex banking, credit, currency, and accounting devices whereby money in its various forms is handled have their origin in modern times, and even more strikingly shown by the fact that the great majority of people in the Middle Ages never saw any money at all during their entire lives. No one, on the other hand, will have to be persuaded how important money has been in the modern world whether he thinks of it in terms of personal life or government debts. A certain belief in connection with money is worth mentioning, though it is not peculiar to capitalist society, the belief, namely, that all forms of money, such as paper money, drafts, credits, etc., have an ultimate dependence upon metallic money, especially silver and gold, and, in developed capitalism, above all on gold. Until recently this was more or less a dogma of most economists, as it still is of some, and various laws, not without some justification in fact, were worked out to relate prices and values, or even the movement of production as a whole, to the amount of metallic money present. 3. In capitalist society, money has not one but two entirely different major economic functions. In the mighty development of the second of these lies another of the distinguishing features of capitalist economy. On the one hand, money is used as a medium of exchange, this is the use which is found in other types of society, and with respect to this use capitalism differs from them only, as we have seen, in the far greater extent, coming close to totality and developed capitalism, to which exchange is carried out through the intermediary of money. On the other hand, money is used as capital, money makes money, and this function was developed little, often not at all, in other types of society. Under capitalism, money can be transformed into raw materials, machines, and labor, products turned out and retranslated into money, and the resultant amount of money can exceed the initial amount, a profit, that is to say, can be made. This process can be carried out, moreover, 
without cheating anyone, without violating any accepted legal or moral law, but, quite the contrary, fully in accordance with accepted rules of justice and morality. It is true that the difference between money functioning as capital and thereby making more money and money functioning as a loan and thereby making interest is somewhat abstruse when once we get beneath the accountant's figures where the difference is usually clear enough. It is also true that money was, though much less extensively, loaned out at interest in other societies, though not in all of them by any means, before capitalism. However, if we note what actually happened, the decisive practical distinction re-emerges. During the Middle Ages, money was loaned on a considerable scale for two primary purposes, for making war, and for what Veblen called conspicuous waste in such projects as building great castles, memorials, and churches. When it was repaid with interest, as it often was not, hence the extremely high nominal rates of interest, often well over 100%, the funds for repayment had been obtained by levying tribute of one sort or another, or by outright pillage of conquered peoples, not, as in the case of money used as capital, from what is regarded as normal productive economic processes. The principal exception to these limitations was long-distance trading, where the merchant, who was in the Middle Ages proper often also the caravan leader or ship's captain, had a chance to make a good deal of money which was perhaps halfway between capital profit and interest on the money he and his friends had put into the venture. Where, in some of the Italian and Germanic towns, additional capital functions of money were to be found, we are meeting the first stages of capitalist economy, not typical feudal economic institutions. This medieval situation is clearly reflected in the writings of the philosophers and theologians on economic subjects. No conception of money functioning as capital can be found in them. Even exacting interest on money loaned, permitting money, even in that sense, to make money, since they realized what uses loans were ordinarily put to, was unequivocally condemned as the grave sin of usury. In designating it a sin, the philosophers were astute, they rightly grasped that the practice was subversive and that if it spread it would work to the destruction of the fabric of their society. Interestingly enough, a moral exception was sometimes made to money loaned at interest for merchant shipping, which, as it was the one important productive use for such funds, was found to be less sinful or even virtuous. 4. Under capitalism, production is carried on for profit. Some writers, more interested in apologizing for capitalism than in understanding it, seem to resent this commonplace observation as a slur. This is perhaps because they understand it in the psychological sense that is often attributed to it, namely, that individual capitalists are psychologically always motivated by a personal desire for profit, which is sometimes, though certainly not invariably, the case. The observation is not, however, psychological, but economic. Normal capitalist production is carried on for profit in the sense that a capitalist enterprise must operate, over a period, at a profit or else close down. What decides whether a shoe factory can keep going is not whether the owner likes to make shoes or whether people are going barefoot or badly shot or whether workers need wages but whether the product can be sold on the market at a profit, however modest. If, over a period of time, there continues to be a loss instead of a profit, then the business folds up. Everybody knows that this is the case. Moreover, this was not the case in medieval economy. In agriculture, by far the chief industry, production was carried on not for a profit but to feed the growers and to allow for the exactions, in kind, for the most part, of feudal suzerains and the church. In other industries, amounting in all to only a minute percentage of the economy, the medieval artisan usually made goods, clothes, say, or furniture or cloth or shoes, only on order from a specific person because that person wanted them, and he usually made the goods out of raw material supplied by the customer. 5. Capitalist economy is strikingly characterized by a special kind of periodic economic crisis, not met with or occurring only very rarely and on limited scales in other types of society. These capitalist crises of production have no relation either to natural catastrophes, drought, famine, plague, etc., or to people's biological and psychological needs for the goods that might be turned out, one or the other of which determine most crises in other types of society. The capitalist crises are determined by economic relations and forces. It is not necessary for our purpose to enter into the disputed question of the exact causes of the crises, whatever account is given, no one denies their reality, their periodic occurrence, and their basic difference from dislocations of production and consumption in other types of society. 
6. In capitalist economy, production as a whole is regulated, so far as it is regulated, primarily by the market, both the internal and the international market. There is no person or group of persons who consciously and deliberately regulates production as a whole. The market decides, independently of the wills of human beings. In the earliest, mercantile, and again in the late stages of capitalist development, monopoly devices and state intervention try to gain some control over production. But they operate only in restricted fields, not in the total productive process, and even in narrow fields they never succeed in emancipating production altogether from the market. This is not surprising, for deliberate regulation of production as a whole, a plan, as it is called nowadays, would be incompatible with the nature of capitalism. It would destroy the commodity basis of the economy, the profit motivation, and the rights of individual ownership. 7. The institutional relations peculiar to capitalist economy serve, finally, to stratify large sections of the population roughly into two special classes. These two classes are not to be found in other types of society for the evident reason that the classes are defined by relations peculiar to capitalism, and neither class can exist without the other, again because they are defined partly in terms of each other. The boundary line between the two classes is by no means exact, and it is possible for given individuals to pass from one of the classes into the other. The general division is nevertheless sufficiently clear. One of these classes is comprised of those who as individuals own, or have an ownership interest in, the instruments of production, factories, mines, land, railroads, machines, whatever they may be, and who hire the labor of others to operate these instruments, retaining the ownership rights and the products of that labor. This class is usually called the bourgeoisie or the capitalists. The second class, usually called the proletariat or the workers, consists of those who are, in a technical sense, free laborers. They are the ones who work for the owners. They are free in that they are freed from, that is, have no ownership interest in, the instruments of production, and in the further sense that they are free to sell their labor to those who do hold such ownership, renouncing, however, ownership rights and the product of their labor. They are, in short, wage workers. It must be emphasized that these two classes did not exist, or existed only to a trivial extent, in other types of society. In many societies, for example, there were slaves and slaveholders. In feudal society the majority of the people were serfs or villains. These engaged in agriculture and were attached to the land, they were not free from the instrument of production, namely, the land, they could not be ousted from the land, which it was their right, not to own in a legal sense, but to use, and, with certain exceptions, they could not leave the land. The industrial crafts were carried on, not by employers and wage workers, but by artisans, who owned their own tools and what machines were used, and worked for themselves. There are, of course, many other features of capitalist economy which I have not mentioned. If our purpose were to analyze capitalism itself, several of these, such as capitalism's dynamic expansionism at certain stages, its technological advances, and others, would be as important as some that I have listed. But our purpose is to analyze not capitalism but the type of society which is succeeding it and in particular to clarify how that type of society differs from capitalism. The review of capitalist society in this chapter, and what it stresses, is wholly subordinate to our central problem. The seven features of capitalist economy which I have summarized are none of them, however, minor. So important and pervasive are they that they seem to many people, seem to many even today, a necessary and permanent part of the structure of social life. People thought, and still think, so automatically in these terms that they do not realize they are doing anything more than recording unchangeable fact. That the owner of a factory should own also its products, that we need money to buy things, that most people should work for wages for others, that a business has to lower production or cut wages or even stop when it can't make a profit, all this seems as natural to many as the need to breathe or eat. Yet history tells flatly that all of these institutions are so far from being inevitably natural to man that they have been present in only a small fraction, the last few hundred years, of the lengthy history of mankind. 2. It is not easy to generalize about the chief characteristics of the political institutions of capitalist society. They show a greater diversity, both at different periods of time and in different nations, than the economic institutions. We can, however, 
select out some, which are either common to capitalist society throughout its history or typical of the chief capitalist powers. 1. The political division of capitalist society has been into a comparatively large number of comparatively large national states. These states have no necessary correspondence with biological groupings or with any personal relations among the citizens of the states. They are fixed by definite though changing geographical boundaries, and claim political jurisdiction over human beings within those boundaries, with the exception of certain privileged foreigners, who are granted extraterritorial rights. The habits of some map makers in school texts make us liable to forget that nations in the modern sense are not at all a universal form of human political organization. The political authority of the national states is embodied in a variety of institutions, the final authority exercised by some man or group of men, usually a parliament. Each nation claims absolute political autonomy or sovereignty, that is, it recognizes no jurisdiction superior to itself, in practice, naturally, it was only the great nations that could uphold such claims. The central and controlling political relation for each individual person is that of being the citizen of a nation. Such a system and conception are in the widest contrast to the medieval system and conception. The central and controlling political relation for each individual person under feudalism, with the exception of the inhabitants of a few towns, was not to be the citizen of the abstracted institution, the nation, but to be so-and-so's man, the vassal or serf of such and such a suzerain. His political loyalty and duty were owed to a person, and, moreover, to the person who was his immediate superior in the feudal hierarchy. Dante's Satan occupies the lowest point in hell for the gravest of all feudal sins, treachery to his lord and benefactor. There was, in medieval Europe, at the same time more unity and greater diversity than in the modern system of national states. The political unity was no doubt far more real in theory than in fact, but through the church, the most powerful of all social institutions, controlling for a while from a third to a half of Europe's arable land, and everywhere present, some genuine unity in law and the conception of political rights and duties did exist. The Church itself claimed, as delegated from God, not only spiritual but political sovereignty over all mankind, and at the height of its power, around the year 1200, came close to making its claim good. Within this partial unity, a kind of political atomism, even chaos, was usual. Hundreds, even thousands, of local feudal lords, counts, barons, dukes, earls, including many bishops and abbots of the church who were feudal lords on their own account, held political power over constantly changing groups of people and territories. The limits of their political sovereignty were never clearly defined and depended ordinarily on their military power of the moment, a vassal lord obeyed his suzerain about as much as his weakness or his schemes made necessary, and little more. The great vassals made no bones about disobeying those who called themselves kings whenever they could get away with it, indeed, Vassals were not seldom more powerful than the nominal kings whom, in words, they might acknowledge. There was nothing even approximating the centralized fundamental authority of the modern national state. 2. Capitalist society was the first which had, in some measure, a world extent. From one point of view, the world ramifications were a result of economic developments, the search for markets, sources of raw materials, and investment outlets was extended everywhere but along with this most of the earth was brought in one way or another within the orbit of capitalist political institutions. The great powers, including within their own immediate borders only a small fraction of the territory and population of the world, reduced most of the rest of the world to either colonies or dominions or spheres of influence or, in many cases, to weak nations dependent for their continued existence upon the sufferance of the powers. The world extension of capitalism did not mean the development everywhere in the world of nations comparable to the few dominating capitalist powers or the full sharing of the social and cultural institutions of capitalist society. Most of Asia, Africa, and the Americas, even southeastern Europe, the greater part of the land and peoples of the earth, that is to say, remained poor and backward relations in the capitalist family. They were parts of capitalist society primarily in the sense of being controlled by, subject to, and indeed, as such, necessary to the existence of, the great capitalist nations. The typical institutions of capitalist culture of the advanced variety, its way of life, made only small dents in their cultural mass. Generalizing the facts, 
we are entitled to conclude that this division on the world arena between the great advanced powers and the subject backward territories and peoples was an integral part of the structural arrangements of capitalist society. 3. By the term, the state, we are referring to the actual central political institutions of society, to the governmental administration, the civil bureaucracy, the army, courts, police, prisons, and so on. The role of the state in capitalist society has varied greatly from time to time and nation to nation, but some traits have remained fairly constant. As compared, for example, with the central political institutions of feudalism, the capitalist state has been very firm and well organized in asserting its authority over certain fields of human activity which have been generally recognized as falling within the state's peculiar jurisdiction. Within its national boundaries, for instance, it has enforced a uniform set of laws, exacted general taxation, controlled the major armed forces, kept lines of communication open, and so on. But, though the state's authority was so firm in some fields, there have been others where it did not penetrate, or penetrated only very lightly. The scope of the activities of the state, that is to say, has been limited. This limitation of the range of the state's activities was a cardinal point in the most famous of all capitalist theories of the state, the liberal theory. The prime interest of liberalism was the promotion of the capitalist economic process. According to the liberal theory of the state, the business of the state was to guarantee civil peace, domestic tranquility, handle foreign wars and relations, and with that to stand aside and let the economic process take care of itself, intervening in the economic process only in a negative way to correct injustices or obstacles and to keep the market free. The state of liberal theory was an unattainable and, in reality, unwished for ideal. Actual states always did intervene in the economic process more actively than the theory called for, with subsidies, tariffs, troops to put down internal disturbances or follow investments to foreign parts, or regulations benefiting one or another group of capitalists. In the early days of capitalism, intervention by the mercantilist state was even more widespread. But in spite of this gap between theory and fact, there was a large kernel of truth in the liberal theory and a decisive, if only partial, correspondence with capitalist reality. The capitalist state intervened in the economic process, but the interventions, in extent and depth, never went beyond what was after all a fairly narrow limit. In the economic field, we might say, the state always appeared as subordinate to, as the handmaiden of, the capitalists, of business, not as their master. There is a simple reason for this relation, capitalist economy is the field of private enterprise, based upon private property rights vested in individuals as individuals, an invasion by the state beyond a certain point into the economic process could only mean the destruction of those individual property rights, in fact even if not in legal theory, and therefore the end of capitalist economic relationships. In many nations there were also other important fields besides the economic which the state's activities touched very little, such as the church, whose separation from the state has been such a cherished doctrine in the political history of the United States. 4. Political authority, sovereignty, cannot remain up in the clouds. It has to be concretized in some man or group of men. We say that the state or nation makes the laws that have to be obeyed, but actually, of course, the laws have to be drawn up and proclaimed by some man or group of men. This task is carried out by different persons and different sorts of institutions in different types of society. The shift in what might be called the institutional locus of sovereignty is always an extremely significant aspect of a general change in the character of society. From this point of view, the history of the political development of capitalism is the history of the shift in the locus of sovereignty to parliament, using the word in its general sense, and more particularly to the lower house of parliament. In almost all capitalist nations, the authority to make laws was vested in a parliament, and the laws were in fact made by the parliament. Moreover, the political shift to Parliament as central authority coincided historically, on the whole, with the general development of capitalist society. The lower house of the English Parliament, it should be noted that both houses together of the U.S. Congress correspond to the single House of Commons in England, where the third estate of the French National Assembly was the recognized representative of the burgess, the bourgeoisie, the merchants, bankers, and industrialists, in short, the capitalist class, together, in the English commons, with the non-feudal squirearchy. The growing institutional supremacy of the lower house of parliament, 
therefore, over the feudal lords and later over the king, who cooperated with the capitalists in the early stages of the modern era, was the parallel in the political field to the supplanting of feudal relations by capitalist relations in the economic field, and it may be added, of feudal ideologies by capitalist ideologies in the cultural field. 5. The restriction of range of the state's activities, noted in 3 above, must not be thought to have any necessary connection with political democracy, nor, in general, is there any necessary connection between democracy and capitalism. The limited state of capitalism may, and there have been many examples in modern history, be an extreme dictatorship in its own political sphere, consider the absolute monarchies of the 16th and 17th centuries, the theocratic state of Oliver Cromwell, the Napoleonic state. Even the supremacy of parliament need not imply any considerable democracy. There may be some grounds for believing that a regime of partial democracy was most natural for consolidated capitalist society. At the least, the most powerful and fully developed capitalist nations have tended toward such a regime. The democracy of the capitalist state was never complete. It did not extend to economic and social relations, for that was excluded by the character of those relations. Even in the political field, it was restricted, in one way or another, to only a portion of the adult population. At all times it was intolerant of any serious opposition opinion that went beyond the general structure of capitalist institutions. Nevertheless, except for some primitive groups, it probably went further than any democracy known in human history before capitalism. In spite of this, we must, particularly today, stress the point that political democracy and capitalism are not the same thing. There have been many politically democratic states in societies which were not capitalist, and there have been many non-democratic states in capitalist society. Political orators, war propagandists, and others who use words emotively rather than scientifically confuse these facts of history. They speak of democracy when they mean capitalism or of capitalism when they mean democracy, or they lump the two together in such phrases as our way of life. If the fate of democracy is in truth bound up with the fate of capitalism, that is something to be independently proved, not to be taken for granted by using language loosely. 6. The legal system of capitalist society, enforced by the state, was, of course, such as to uphold the general structure of capitalist society and to set up and enforce rules for acting within that structure. 3. It is even harder than in the case of political institutions to generalize about the belief patterns of capitalist society. For our purpose, however, it is not necessary to be at all complete. It is enough if we choose a few prominent beliefs, the prominence can be tested by their appearance in great public documents such as constitutions, or declarations of independence or of the rights of man, which nearly everyone will recognize as typical of capitalist society and which both differ from typical feudal beliefs and are sharply at issue in the present period of social transition. The beliefs with which we are concerned are often called ideologies, and we should be clear what we mean by ideology. An ideology is similar in the social sphere to what is sometimes called rationalization in the sphere of individual psychology. An ideology is not a scientific theory, but is non-scientific and often anti-scientific. It is the expression of hopes, wishes, fears, ideals, not a hypothesis about events, though ideologies are often thought by those who hold them to be scientific theories. Thus the theory of evolution or of relativity or of the electronic composition of matter are scientific theories, whereas the doctrines of the preambles to the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States, the Nazi racial doctrines, Marxian dialectical materialism, St. Anselm's doctrine of the meaning of world history, are ideologies. Ideologies capable of influencing and winning the acceptance of great masses of people are an indispensable verbal cement holding the fabric of any given type of society together. Analysis of ideologies in terms of their practical effects shows us that they ordinarily work to serve and advance the interests of some particular social group or class, and we may therefore speak of a given ideology as being that of the group or class in question. However, it is even more important to observe that no major ideology is content to profess openly that it speaks only for the group whose interests it in fact expresses. Each group insists that its ideologies are universal in validity and express the interests of humanity as a whole and each group tries to win universal acceptance for its ideologies. This is true of all the ideologies mentioned in the preceding paragraph. The significance of ideologies will be further elaborated in connection with the managerial revolution. 
1. Among the elements entering into the ideologies typical of capitalist society, there must be prominently included, though it is not so easy to define what we mean by it, individualism. Capitalist thought, whether reflected in theology or art or legal, economic, and political theory, or philosophy or morality, has exhibited a steady concentration on the idea of the individual. We find the individual wherever we turn, in Luther's appeal to private interpretation of the Bible as the test of religious truth, in the exaggerated place of conscience in Puritanism, in the economic notion of the economic processes consisting of millions of separated individuals each pursuing his own highest profit, or the correlated moral notion of moralities consisting in each individual's pursuing his own greatest personal pleasure, in the individualistic geniuses of Renaissance and modern art or the individualistic heroes of modern literature, the fascination that Hamlet has had for capitalist society is well deserved, in the very conception of the heart of democracies lying in the private individuals privately setting forth his will by marking a private ballot. Now the individualist idea of the individual is not an ultimate any more than any other idea. It has its special and distinguishing features, differing from those possessed by the idea of the individual found in other types of society. According to the prevailing capitalist idea, the fundamental unit of politics, psychology, sociology, morality, theology, economics was thought of as the single human individual. This individual was understood as complete in himself, in his own nature, and as having only external relations to other persons and things. Though Hegel and his followers notoriously reject this conception, it is unquestionably typical, and is implicit where not explicit in most of the influential doctrines and public documents of the fields just mentioned. The Church, the State, the ideal utopia, are not realities in themselves but only numerical sums of the individuals who compose them. 2. In keeping with the general ideology of individualism was the stress placed by capitalist society on the notion of private initiative. Private initiative, supposed, in the chief instance, to provide the mainspring of the economic process, was discovered also at the root of psychological motivation and moral activity. 3. The status of the capitalist individual was further defined with the help of doctrines of natural rights, free contract, the standard civil rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, etc., which are held to belong in some necessary and eternal sense to each individual. There is no complete agreement on just what these rights are, but lists of them are given in such documents as the Declaration of Independence, the Preamble and Bill of Rights of the Constitution of the United States, or the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. 4. Finally, in capitalist society, the theological and supernatural interpretation of the meaning of world history was replaced by the idea of progress, first appearing in the writers of the Renaissance and being given definite formulation during the 18th century. There were two factors in the idea of progress, first, that mankind was advancing steadily and inevitably to better and better things, and, second, the definition of the goal toward which the advance is taking place in naturalistic terms, in terms we might say of an earthly instead of a heavenly paradise. It should not be supposed that there was any systematically worked out ideology which can be considered the ideology of capitalism. Many variants are possible. Dozens of differing ideologies were elaborated by philosophers, political theorists, and other intellectuals. Their concepts, slogans, and phrases, filtered down, became the commonplaces of mass thinking. But all, or almost all, the ideologies, and the mass thinking, were, we might say, variations on related themes. They had a common focus in a commonly held set of words and ideas and assumptions, among which were prominently to be found those that I have listed. 4. In developed capitalist society it is evident that the position of greatest social power and privilege was occupied by the capitalists, the bourgeoisie. The instruments of economic production are, simply, the means whereby men live. In any society, the group of persons controlling these means is by that very fact socially dominant. The bourgeoisie, therefore, may be called in capitalist society the ruling class. However, the idea of a ruling class, as well as the notion of a struggle for power among classes, raise issues so closely related to the central problem of this book that I propose to return to them in greater detail in Chapter 5. Probably no one would agree throughout with the selection and emphasis I have made in this outline of major features of capitalist society. However, few would, I think, 
deny that these are among the major features, or, more important, that the disappearance of any considerable percentage of them would make it hard to regard the consequent structure of society as any longer capitalist. That all of these features, and many others along with them, will disappear, and disappear in a matter of years, or decades at the most, not generations, is the negative half of the theory of the managerial revolution. Chapter 3. The Theory of the Permanence of Capitalism During the past century, dozens, perhaps even hundreds, of theories of history have been elaborated. These differ endlessly among themselves in the words they use, the causal explanations they offer for the historical process, the alleged laws of history which they seem to discover. But most of these differences are irrelevant to the central problem with which this book is concerned. That problem is to discover, if possible, what type, if indeed it is to be a different type, of social organization is on the immediate historical horizon. With reference to this specific problem, all of the theories, with the exception of those few which approximate to the theory of the managerial revolution, boil down to two and only two. The first of these predicts that capitalism will continue for an indefinite, but long, time, if not forever, that is, that the major institutions of capitalist society, or at least most of them, will not be radically changed. The second predicts that capitalist society will be replaced by socialist society. The theory of the managerial revolution predicts that capitalist society will be replaced by managerial society, the nature of which will be later explained, that, in fact, the transition from capitalist society to managerial society is already well underway. It is clear that, although all three of these theories might be false, only one of them can be true. The answer that each of them gives to the question of what will actually happen in the future plainly denies the answers given by the other two. If, then, the theory of the managerial revolution is true, it must be possible to present considerations sufficient to justify us in regarding the other two theories as false. Such demonstration would, by itself, make the theory of the managerial revolution very probable, since, apart from these three, there are at present no other serious theoretical contenders. I propose, therefore, in this and the following chapter to review briefly the evidence for rejecting the theory of the permanence of capitalism and the theory of the socialist revolution. Oddly enough, the belief that capitalist society will continue is seldom put in theoretical form. It is rather left implicit in what people say and do, and in the writings and sayings of most historians, sociologists, and politicians. Nevertheless, there is little doubt that the majority of people in the United States hold this belief, though it has been somewhat shaken in recent years. When examined, this belief is seen to be based not on any evidence in its favor but primarily on two assumptions. Both of these assumptions are flatly and entirely false. The first is the assumption that society has always been capitalist in structure, and, therefore, presumably always will be. In actual fact, society has been capitalist for a minute fragment of total human history. Any exact date chosen as the beginning of capitalism would be arbitrary. But the start of capitalist social organization on any wide scale can scarcely be put earlier than the 14th century, AD, and capitalist domination must be placed much later than that. The second assumption is that capitalism has some necessary kind of correlation with human nature. This, as a matter of fact, is the same assumption as the first but expressed differently. To see that it is false, it is not required to be sure just what human nature may be. It is enough to observe that human nature has been able to adapt itself to dozens of types of society, many of which have been studied by anthropologists and historians and a number of which have lasted far longer than capitalism. With these assumptions dropped, the positive case for the view that capitalism will continue doesn't amount to much, in fact has hardly even been stated coherently by anyone. But, apart from this lack of positive defense, we can, I think, list certain sets of facts which give all the grounds that a reasonable man should need for believing that capitalism is not going to continue, that it will disappear in a couple of decades at most and perhaps in a couple of years, which is as exact as one should pretend to be in these matters. These facts do not demonstrate this in the way that a mathematical or logical theorem is demonstrated. No belief about future events can be so demonstrated. They simply make the belief more probable than any alternative belief, which is as much as can be done. In what follows, for reasons which will become evident later, I do not include reference to Germany, 
Italy, or Russia? 1. The first, and perhaps crucial, evidence for the view that capitalism is not going to continue much longer is the continuous presence within the capitalist nations of mass unemployment and the failure of all means tried for getting rid of mass unemployment. The unemployed, it is especially significant to note, include large percentages of the youth just entering working age. Continuous mass unemployment is not new in history. It is in fact, a symptom that a given type of social organization is just about finished. It was found among the poorer citizens during the last years of Athens, among the urban proletariat, as they were called, in the Roman Empire, and very notably, at the end of the Middle Ages, among the dispossessed serfs and villains who had been thrown off the land in order to make way for capitalist use of the land. Mass unemployment means that the given type of social organization has broken down, that it cannot any longer provide its members with socially useful functions even according to its own ideas of what is socially useful. It cannot support these masses for any length of time in idleness, for its resources are not sufficient. The unemployed hover on the fringe of society, on the one hand like a terrible weight dragging it down and bleeding it to death, on the other a constant irritant and reservoir of forces directed against the society. Experience has already shown that there is not the slightest prospect of ridding capitalism of mass unemployment. This is indeed becoming widely admitted among the defenders of capitalism, as well as many spokesmen of the New Deal. Even total war, the most drastic conceivable solution, could not end mass unemployment in England and France, nor will it do so in this country. Every solution that has any possibility of succeeding leads, directly or indirectly, outside the framework of capitalism. 2. Capitalism has always been characterized by recurring economic crises, by periods of boom followed by periods of depression. Until a dozen years ago, however, the curve of total production always went higher in one major boom period than in the boom preceding. It did so not only in terms of the actual quantity of goods produced but in the relative quantity of the volume of goods compared to the increased population and plant capacity. Thus, in spite of the crises, there was a general overall increase in capitalist production which was simply the measure of the ability of capitalist social organization to handle its own resources. Since the world crisis of 1927-29, this overall curve has reversed, the height of a boom period, relative to population and potential capacity, is lower than that of the preceding boom. This new direction of the curve is, in its turn, simply the expression of the fact that capitalism can no longer handle its own resources. 3. The volume of public and private debt has reached a point where it cannot be managed much longer. The debt, like the unemployed, sucks away the diminishing bloodstream of capitalism. And it cannot be shaken off. Bankruptcies, which formerly readjusted the debt position of capitalism, hardly make a dent in it. The scale of bankruptcy or inflation which could reduce the debt to manageable size would at the same time, as all economists recognize, utterly dislocate all capitalist institutions. 4. The maintenance of the capitalist market depended on at least comparatively free monetary exchange transactions. The area of these, especially on a world scale, is diminishing toward a vanishing point. This is well indicated by the useless gold hoard at Fort Knox and the barter methods of Russia, Germany, and Italy. 5. Since shortly after the First World War, there has been in all major capitalist nations a permanent agricultural depression. Agriculture is obviously an indispensable part of the total economy, and the breakdown in this essential sector is another mark of the incurable disease afflicting capitalism. No remedies, and how many they are that have been tried. Produce any sign of cure. The farming populations sink in debt and poverty, and not enough food is produced and distributed, while agriculture is kept barely going through huge state subsidies. 6. Capitalism is no longer able to find uses for the available investment funds, which waste in idleness in the account books of the banks. This mass unemployment of private money is scarcely less indicative of the death of capitalism than the mass unemployment of human beings. Both show the inability of the capitalist institutions any longer to organize human activities. During the past decade in the United States, as in other capitalist nations, New capital investment has come almost entirely from state, not from private, funds. 7. The continuance of capitalism was, we saw, dependent upon a certain relationship between the great powers and the backward sections and peoples of the earth. 
one of the most striking developments of the past 15 years, which has been little noticed, is the inability of the great capitalist nations any longer to manage the exploitation and development of these backward sections. This is nowhere better illustrated than in the relations between the United States and South America. The United States, in spite of its imperious necessity for the nation's very survival, has not and cannot devise a scheme for handling the economic phase of its hemisphere policy. Though during the past few years and above all during the war the road has been wide open, nothing gets done. Here again, the only workable schemes are compelled to leave the basis of capitalism. 8. Capitalism is no longer able to use its own technological possibilities. One side of this is shown by such facts as the inability of the United States to carry out a housing program, when the houses are needed and wanted and the technical means to produce them in abundance are on hand. This is the case with almost all goods, but an equally symptomatic side is seen in the inability to make use of many inventions and new technical methods. Hundreds of these, though they could reduce immeasurably the number of man-hours needed to turn out goods, and increase greatly the convenience of life, nonetheless sit on the shelf. In many entire economic sectors, such as agriculture, building, coal mining, the technical methods today available make the usual present methods seem stone age, and nearly every economic field is to some degree affected. Using the inventions and methods available would, it is correctly understood, smash up the capitalist structure. Technological unemployment is present in recent capitalism, but it is hardly anything compared to what technological unemployment would be if capitalism made use of its available technology. These facts, also, show that capitalism and its rulers can no longer use their own resources. And the point is that, if they won't, someone else will. 9. As symptomatic and decisive as these economic and technical developments is the fact that the ideologies of capitalism, the bourgeois ideologies, have become impotent. Ideologies, we have seen, are the cement that binds together the social fabric, when the cement loosens, the fabric is about to disintegrate. And no one who has watched the world during the past 20 years can doubt the ever-increasing impotence of the bourgeois ideologies. On the one hand, the scientific pretensions of these ideologies have been exploded. History, sociology, and anthropology are not yet much as sciences, but they are enough to show every serious person that the concepts of the bourgeois ideologies are not written in the stars, are not universal laws of nature, but are at best just temporary expressions of the interests and ideals of a particular class of men at a particular historical time. But the scientific inadequacy of the ideologies would not by itself be decisive. It does not matter how non-scientific or anti-scientific an ideology may be, it can do its work so long as it possesses the power to move great masses of men to action. This the bourgeois ideologies once could do, as the great revolutions and the imperial and economic conquests prove. And this they can no longer do. When the bourgeois ideologies were challenged in the Tsar and the Sudetenland by the ideology of Nazism, it was Nazism that won the sentiment of the overwhelming majority of the people. All possible discounts for the effects of Nazi terrorism must not delude us into misreading this brute fact. Only the hopelessly naive can imagine that France fell so swiftly because of the mere mechanical strength of the Nazi war machine, that might have been sufficient in a longer run, but not to destroy a great nation with a colossal military establishment in a few weeks. France collapsed so swiftly because its people had no heart for the war, as every observer had remarked, even through the censorship, from the beginning of the war and they had no heart for the war because the bourgeois ideologies by which they were appealed to no longer had power to move their hearts. Men are prepared to be heroes for very foolish and unworthy ideals, but they must at least believe in those ideals. Nowhere is the impotence of bourgeois ideologies more apparent than among the youth, and the coming world, after all, will be the youth's world. The abject failure of voluntary military enlistment in Britain in this country tells its own story to all who wish to listen. It is underlined in reverse by the hundreds of distinguished adult voices which during 1940 began reproaching the American youth for indifference, unwillingness to sacrifice, lack of ideals. How right these reproaches are! And how little effect they have! In truth, the bourgeoisie itself has in large measure lost confidence in its own ideologies. The words begin to have a hollow sound in the most sympathetic capitalist ears. This, too, is unmistakably revealed in the policy and attitude of England's rulers during the past years. 
what was Munich and the whole policy of appeasement but a recognition of bourgeois impotence? The head of the British government's travelling to the feet of the Austrian house painter was the fitting symbol of the capitalists' loss of faith in themselves. Every authentic report during the autumn of 1939 from Britain told of the discouragement and fear of the leaders in government and business. And no one who has listened to American leaders off the record or who has followed the less public organs of business opinion will suppose that such attitudes are confined to Britain. All history makes clear that an indispensable quality of any man or class that wishes to lead, to hold power and privilege in society, is boundless self-confidence. Other sets of facts could easily be added to this list, but these are perhaps the most plainly symptomatic. Their effect, moreover, is cumulative, the attempted remedies for them, experience shows, only aggravate them. They permit no other conclusion than that the capitalist organization of society has entered its final years. Chapter 4. The Theory of the Proletarian Socialist Revolution The second and only other serious alternative to the theory of the managerial revolution is the theory that capitalist society is to be replaced by socialist society. This belief is held by socialists, communists, in general by all who call themselves Marxists, and, in slightly different words, by anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists. Interestingly enough, it is also held by many others who do not at all consider themselves to be Marxists, by not a few, even, who are against socialism. Many liberals believe that socialism is going to come. And there are staunch capitalists and defenders of capitalism, who, though the prospect is not at all to their taste, believe likewise. First, we must be clear about what is meant by socialist society. It is worth emphasizing that with respect to the central and only problem of this book, the problem of what type of society is to prevail in the immediate future and for the next period of human history, the theories of anarchists, socialists, communists, and their subvarieties are the same. They all agree, in general, as to what they mean by socialist society, even though they may call it something else, communism or anarchist society, and they all agree that it is going to come. Their differences are on how it is going to come and on what ought to be done to help it along, not on the prediction that it will come. The determining characteristics of what they mean by socialist society are that it is classless, fully democratic, and international. By classless is meant that in socialist society no person or group of persons has, directly or indirectly, any property rights in the instruments of production different from those possessed by every other person and group. It amounts to the same thing to say that in socialist society there are no property rights in the instruments of production, since a property right has meaning only if it differentiates the status of those who have it from that of those who do not. The democracy of the hypothetical socialist society is to extend, and completely, to all social spheres, political, economic, and social. And socialist society is to be organized on an international scale, if this cannot be done completely in the first stages, at least this is to be the tendency of socialism. If not at once international, it is to be always internationalist, as indeed it would have to be if it is ever to become actually international. There is another important point of agreement, at least since Marx himself, among all the serious organized groups which have held the theory we are now analyzing. This is the belief that the working class, the proletariat, has a special and decisive role to play in the transformation of society along socialist lines. The main strength of the social movement that will establish socialism is to be drawn from the working class. This belief can readily be granted, for, if the main strength did not come from the working class, where indeed could it come from? Put very simply, the Marxist movement understands the process as follows, the working class will take over state power, by insurrectionary means according to the Leninist wing of Marxism, by parliamentary means according to the reformist wing, the state will then abolish private property either all at once or over a short period of time, and, after a certain period of adjustment, called by the Leninist wing the dictatorship of the proletariat, socialism will be ushered in. Under socialism itself, in keeping with its fully democratic, classless structure, state power in the sense of the coercive institutions of government, police, army, prisons, will disappear altogether. Anarchism differs from Marxism in believing that the state cannot be used for ushering in the free classless society, but must be abolished at once, with the job of socialization to be carried out by the workers' organizations, unions, cooperatives, etc. The net result, however, is the same. 
Those who believe that capitalist society is to be replaced by socialist society, in particular Marxists, to whom we are justified in devoting primary attention, also, of course, believe that capitalist society is not going to last, which is implied by their more general belief. This second belief, that capitalism is not going to last, is identical with the conclusion of chapter 3, and I naturally have no quarrel with it, though I do not agree with all of the reasons which Marxists advance for holding the belief. But the proposition that capitalism is not going to last much longer is not at all the same as the proposition that socialism is going to replace it. There is no necessary connection between the two. And our primary concern is with the second. A survey of Marxist literature quickly reveals that it is far, far weightier in the analysis of capitalism by which it reaches the conclusion that capitalism will not last, though Marx himself gravely underestimated the time span allotted to capitalism, than in the analysis by which it motivates the all-important positive belief that socialism will replace capitalism. Yet the fullest agreement with the first, and I agree with very much of it, does not in any way compel us to accept the second. In fact, careful study will show that Marxists offer scarcely any evidence for the second belief. They base it almost entirely upon one argument and two assumptions. The argument is meaningless with respect to the problem, one assumption is either meaningless or false, and the second is simply false. The argument is a deduction from the metaphysical theory of dialectical materialism. It is held that Hegel's metaphysical logic of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis somehow guarantees that out of the clash of the two antithetical classes, bourgeoisie and proletariat, socialism will issue. The deduction may be all right, but no deduction from any metaphysical theory can ever tell us what is going to happen in the actual world of space and time, this we can predict, with some measure of probability, only from experience and the inferences which we make from experience. This argument, therefore, need concern us no further. The first assumption is put by Marxists, and others, in this way, that socialism is the only alternative to capitalism. They then assert, in effect, the following syllogism, since capitalism is not going to last, which we have granted, and since socialism is the only alternative to capitalism, therefore socialism is going to come. The syllogism is perfectly valid, but its conclusion is not necessarily true unless the second premise is true, and that is just the problem in dispute. It is hard to know just what is meant by the statement that socialism is the only alternative to capitalism. If this is another deduction from the metaphysics, it is meaningless so far as predicting the future goes. Logically, there are any number, a theoretically infinite number, of alternatives to capitalism, including all the types of society there ever have been and all that anyone can imagine. Practically, no doubt, most of these can be disregarded, since they are fantastic in relation to the actual situation in the world. But at least a few can surely not be ruled out in advance without examining the actual evidence. And the evidence will show that another type of society, managerial society, is not merely a possible alternative to both socialism and capitalism, which is enough to upset the assumption, but a more probable alternative than either. The second assumption is, in effect, the following, that the abolition of capitalist private property rights in the instruments of production is a sufficient condition, a sufficient guarantee, of the establishment of socialism, that is, of a free, classless society. Now we already have available historical evidence, both from ancient and modern times, to show that this assumption is not correct. Effective class domination and privilege does, it is true, require control over the instruments of production, but this need not be exercised through individual private property rights. It can be done through what might be called corporate rights, possessed not by individuals as such but by institutions, as was the case conspicuously with many societies in which a priestly class was dominant, in numerous primitive cultures, in Egypt, to some degree in the Middle Ages. In such societies there can be and have been a few rich and many poor, a few powerful and many oppressed, just as in societies, like the capitalist, where property rights are vested in private individuals as such. Russia, as we shall repeatedly see, has already proved that such phenomena are not confined to former ages. The assumption that the abolition of capitalist private property guarantees socialism must be entirely rejected. It has simply no justification on the facts. It is a hope, that is all, and, like so many hopes, one scheduled for disappointment. With the collapse of this argument and these assumptions, 
the case for the belief that socialism is coming is very slight. Of course, many people would like it to come, and regard socialism as the noblest and best form of society that could be sought as an ideal. But we must not permit our wishes to interfere with a reasoned estimate of the facts. The prediction that socialism is coming could correctly rest only upon a demonstration drawn from contemporary events themselves, upon showing that there are present today in society powerful tendencies, more powerful than any other, toward socialism, that socialism is the most probable outcome of what is happening. And contemporary events show nothing of the kind, they seem to some to do so only because they accept these unjustified assumptions or because they confuse their wishes with reality. Moreover, there is ample evidence from actual events that socialism is not coming, and we must now turn to a brief survey of some of this evidence. Among the evidence, the facts about the Marxist movement itself are especially significant, since the Marxist movement is the chief organized social force, if there is any, through which the establishment of socialism could take place. And here a word of methodological warning is in order. The Marxist movement is subdivided into many groups. The two chief of these, in numbers and influence, are the reformist, socialist, or social democratic, wing, consisting primarily of those parties loosely affiliated with the Second International, together with a number of unaffiliated parties in various countries having similar programs, and the Stalinist wing, consisting of those parties which are sections of the Communist or Third International. In addition to these, there are the opposition branches sprung, like Stalinism, from the Leninist adaptation of Marxism, chief among which are the small Trotskyist parties joined in what they call the Fourth International, and countless additional parties, groups, and sects, each claiming dissent in its own way from Marx. When I speak of the Marxist movement or of Marxists, I mean all of these groups and individuals, all those, that is to say, identified in common speech as Marxist and who, historically and theoretically, have a plausible connection with Marx and Marxist theories. This must be made clear because of a habit which Marxists have taken over, perhaps, from the Church. Whenever an analysis is made of actions of members of the Church or institutions of the Church which might seem to be detrimental to the good name of the Church and its divine claims, the reply is always given that these actions are not really those of the Church, which is a mystic and supernatural body, but only of some erring human acting not for the Church but in keeping with his sinful human nature. By this argumentative method, the record of the Church is, of course, perfect. Similarly, each variety of Marxist denies responsibility for the actions of all other varieties, and indeed for all actions of his own group which have not worked out well or which have seemed to move away from instead of toward socialism. Just as with the Church, the case for Marxism is irreproachable by this method. We can, however, permit neither of them this comforting luxury. When we deal the cards, we will make sure that they are not stacked. 1. The Russian events, since 1917, will occupy us in other connections. Here I wish to observe that, taken at their face value, they are powerful evidence against the theory that socialism is coming. Of course I refer to the actual events, not the fairy stories spun by the official and unofficial Soviet apologists. The main pattern of these events is plain enough for anyone who wants to know it, and there is no way to make anyone see who has decided in advance to keep his eyes shut. In November, 1917, the Bolshevik Party, professing a program of the transformation of society to a socialist structure and supported by a large proportion, probably a majority, of the Russian workers and poorer peasants, took over state power in Russia. A few months later, private property rights and the chief instruments of production were abolished, and property rights were vested in the state. During the first years of the revolution, the regime successfully defended itself in a series of civil wars and wars of intervention by hostile powers. The regime has kept in power ever since and is now in its 24th year. Socialist society means, we have seen, a society which is classless, democratic, and international. If socialism is in truth realizable, if it is scheduled to be the type of society for the next period of human history, we would not, perhaps, necessarily have expected that Russia should already have achieved socialism. We would rightly take into account the special difficulties resulting from the fact that the revolution occurred not in an advanced nation but in Russia, in 1917, that is, in a nation very backward both economically and culturally, devastated by the results of the war, and surrounded by enemies both external and internal, though at the same time we would wonder why, 
contrary to the opinion of all socialist theoreticians prior to 1917, the revolution did occur in a backward instead of an advanced country. Nevertheless, we should correctly expect, on the basis of the theory that socialism is on its way, to find, without difficulty and prominently to be noticed, unmistakable tendencies toward socialism. This would mean that, though Russia today would not necessarily be socialist, that is, free, classless, and international, yet it would be closer than it was at the beginning of the revolution, more free, nearer to the elimination of classes and class distinctions, and, if not international, then internationalist. Such expectations were in fact held by the leaders of the revolution itself and by most others who believed in socialist theory, even those unsympathetic to Russia. Indeed, these expectations were so strong among Marxists that they acted as effective dark glasses, preventing Marxists from seeing, or admitting if they saw, what was actually going on in Russia. Today they still continue to blind the Stalinist dupes to be found in all countries. Reality, however, as is so often the case, was rude to the optimistic expectations. Far from showing tendencies toward socialism, far from taking steps in the direction of socialism, the Russian Revolutionary Society developed in a plainly contrary direction. With respect to the three decisive characteristics of socialist society, classlessness, freedom, and internationalism, Russia is immeasurably further away today than during the first years of the revolution, nor has this direction been episodic but rather a continuous development since those early years. This has occurred in direct contradiction to Marx's theory, in Russia the key conditions, as it was thought, for the advance, if not to socialism at least well into its direction, were present, the assumption of state power by a Marxist party of the workers, and above all the supposedly crucial abolition of private property rights and the chief instruments of production. The capitalists were, with trivial exceptions, eliminated from Russian society and have not returned. In spite of this, a new class stratification, along economic lines, has proceeded to such a point that it equals or exceeds in sharpness that found in capitalist nations. This is shown on the one hand in the absolute elimination of the great masses of the people from any shred of control, the crux of property right, over the instruments of production. It is shown equally well in the income stratification. According to Leon Trotsky, in an article published in late 1939, and to my personal knowledge based on a careful collation and analysis of statistics published in the Soviet press, the upper 11% or 12% of the Soviet population now receives approximately 50% of the national income. This differentiation is sharper than in the United States, where the upper 10% of the population receives approximately 35% of the national income. If it is objected that Trotsky, as an enemy of Stalin, would have been prejudiced in giving this figure, it may be remarked that this article was written when Trotsky was in the midst of a bitter polemical struggle against views held primarily by myself in which he defended his unshaken belief that Russia remained still a worker's socialized state, the normal bias, if there were any, would under the circumstances have veered toward a playing down rather than up of the degree of class stratification as shown by income figures. The percentages, moreover, correspond well enough with those given by other competent observers, the Stalinist apologists, who are not competent, have not even pretended to give figures on so delicate a question, and allowance for a very wide margin of error would not alter the significance. Though freedom and democracy were never very extensive in revolutionary Russia, there was a considerable measure during the first years of the revolution, the years, that is to say, of greatest tribulation, of famine and civil war and wars of intervention, when any type of society and regime might well have been expected to lessen or suspend freedom. The democracy was represented by the existence of legal opposition parties, public factions of the Bolshevik party itself, important rights possessed by local Soviets, workers' committees in factories, trade unions, etc., and by such factors as the elimination of titles, special modes of addressing superiors, fancy uniforms, educational discrimination, and the other outward marks of social class distinctions. Every shred of freedom and democracy has by now been purged from Russian life. No opposition of any kind, the lifeblood of any freedom, is permitted, no independent rights are possessed by any organization or institution, and the outward marks of class differences and despotism have one by one returned. All the evidence indicates that the tyranny of the Russian regime is the most extreme that has ever existed in human history, not accepting the regime of Hitler. In keeping with socialist theories of internationalism, 
the leaders of the Russian Revolution expected their spark to touch off the World Revolution. This did not happen, but for the early years the leaders remained internationalist in outlook and practice, theoretically indifferent to national boundaries, and looking upon the Russian state itself as merely a fort of the international socialist masses, to be used or sacrificed if need be to the higher interests of the World Revolution. After the first years, for this internationalism there was substituted an ever-growing nationalism which has in recent times come to exceed anything ever present under the Tsars themselves. The pseudo-internationalism, still occasionally manifested and allegedly represented by the existence of the Communist International and its parties, is simply the extension of Russian nationalism on the world arena and internationalist only in the sense that Hitler's fifth columns or the British or United States intelligence services are internationalist. If we review honestly the developments in Russia, it is clear that in no important respect has the theory that socialism is coming been justified, every Russian development runs counter to what that theory leads us, and did lead those who believed it, to expect. Naturally, dialecticians can explain away what has happened in Russia. They can say that it was all because Stalin got into power instead of Trotsky or because of the failure of other nations to revolt or because of Russia's backwardness. Next time, things will be different. But the fact remains that Stalin did get into power, that the other nations did not successfully revolt, and that the revolution did take place in a backward country, and that the Russian revolution led not toward socialism but toward something most unlike socialism. Russia was, and this is admitted by all parties, the first experiment in socialism. The results of this experiment are evidence for the view that socialism is not possible of achievement or even of approximation in the present period of history. Such an experiment, or even several of them, are not by themselves conclusive and final demonstration, no experiments are ever conclusive and final. But we must draw the lessons of the facts we have until, perhaps, different facts are placed at our disposal. But to anticipate briefly, Though Russia did not move toward socialism, at the same time it did not move back to capitalism. This is a point which is of key significance for the problem of this book. All of those who predicted what would happen in Russia, friends and enemies, shared the assumption which I have already discussed in this chapter, that socialism is the only alternative to capitalism, from which it followed that Russia, since presumably it could not stay still, would either move toward socialism or back to the restoration of capitalism. Neither of these anticipated developments has taken place. All of the attempts to explain the present Russian setup as capitalist, of which there have recently been a number, were about to become capitalist have broken down miserably, no capitalist has any illusions on that score. Trotsky, otherwise the most brilliant of all analysts of Russia, to his death clung desperately to this either, or assumption, and in late years consequently became less and less able to explain sensibly or predict what happened. The only way out of the theoretical jam is to recognize that the assumption must be dropped, that socialism and capitalism are not the sole alternatives, that Russia's motion has been toward neither capitalism nor socialism, but toward managerial society, the type of society now in the process of replacing capitalist society on a world scale. 2. The second set of facts, constituting evidence that socialism is not coming, has already been mentioned, the expected socialist revolution, even the nominally socialist revolution such as took place in Russia, did not take place elsewhere, or, if attempted as in Germany, several Balkan nations, and in China, did not succeed. Yet socialist theory gave every reason to expect that it would come and would succeed, and socialist theoreticians did expect it. All important conditions supposed to be necessary for the transition to socialism were present in the immediate post-war era. The working class, presumed carrier of the socialist revolution, proved unable to take power, much less to inaugurate socialism. Yet most of the capitalist world was in shambles, the workers, as the principal part of the mass armies, had arms in their hands, and the example of Russia was before them. 3. One point of great importance has been proved conclusively by the Russian events, namely, that the second assumption we have discussed, the assumption that the abolition of capitalist private property rights and the instruments of production is a sufficient condition a sufficient guarantee, of the establishment of socialism, is false. These rights were abolished in Russia, in 1918. Socialism has not come about, nor even been approached. In fact, the abolition of these rights not merely did not guarantee socialism, but did not even keep power in the hands of the workers, who, today, have no power at all. 
the presumed necessary connection between doing away with capitalist private property rights, on the one hand, and classlessness and freedom, on the other, does not exist. This the facts have proved, and theory, if theory is to make the slightest pretense to representing the facts, will have to adjust itself accordingly. This, in turn, is close to decisive for the belief that socialism is about to come. For this belief was really based, more than on anything else, on the conviction that this necessary connection did exist. The problem of bringing socialism, the free, classless, international society of Marx's ideal and Marx's predictions, has always been thought, by all varieties of Marxists, to be, in final analysis, that of doing away with bourgeois private property rights. Now we know that this is not enough to bring socialism. If we still believe that socialism is possible, we will have to believe it on other grounds than those which were felt in the past to be sufficient. 4. If socialism is to come, the working class, as we have seen, has always, and rightly, been held to be the primary social group which will have a hand in its coming. According to Marx himself, the inherent development of capitalist society as it tended toward centralization and monopoly was such that there would take place the proletarianization of the overwhelming bulk of the population, that is, almost everyone would become workers. This made socialism easy, because the workers would have almost no one except a handful of finance capitalists to oppose their course. As is well known, this development did not take place as predicted by Marx. Sectors of the economy even of advanced nations, in particular agriculture, resisted the process of reduction to full capitalist social relations, most persons engaging in agriculture are neither capitalists nor workers, in the technical sense, but small independent producers. Small independent proprietors remain in many lines of endeavor, and the last 75 years have seen the growth of the so-called new middle class, the salaried executives and engineers and managers and accountants and bureaucrats and the rest, who do not fit without distortion into either the capitalist or worker category. This was already evident before 1914. Since the First World War, however, the social position of the working class has gravely deteriorated. This deterioration may be seen in a number of related developments. a. The rate of increase in the number of workers, especially the decisive industrial workers, compared to the total population has slowed down, and in the last decade, in many nations, has changed to a decrease. b. The bulk of the unemployed come from the working class. c. Changes in the technique of industry have, on the one hand, reduced more and more workers to an unskilled, or close to unskilled, category, but, on the other, have tied the process of production more and more critically to certain highly specialized skills, of engineering, production planning, and the like, requiring elaborate training not possessed by, or available to, many workers. With the methods of production used in Marx's own day, there was a higher percentage of skilled workers to unskilled. The gap in training between an average worker and the average engineer or production manager was not so large, indeed, in most plants and enterprises there was no need to recognize a separate category of engineers and scientists and production managers, since their work was either not needed or could be performed by any skilled worker. Today, however, without the highly trained technical workers the production machine would quickly run down, as soon as serious trouble arose, or change or replacement was needed, or plans for a new production run were to be made, there would be no way of handling the difficulties. This alters gravely the relative position of the workers in the productive process. In Marx's time one could think without too much strain of the workers taking over the factories and mines and railroads and shipyards, and running them for themselves, at least, on the side of the actual running of the productive machine, there was no reason to suppose that the workers could not handle it. Such a possibility is today excluded on purely technical grounds if on no others. The workers, the proletarians, could not, by themselves, run the productive machine of contemporary society. d. There has been a corresponding change in the technique of making war, which, since social relations are ultimately a question of relative power, is equally decisive as a mark of the deterioration in the social position of the working class. Capitalist society was the first advanced culture to introduce mass militias, or armies of the citizenry. The mass armies were proved to be necessary to capitalism, as Machiavelli had foretold, by the unfortunate experiences with mercenary armies and then, later, small standing armies, the characteristic troops of the first centuries of capitalist society. 
but mass armies were at the same time potentially dangerous to the rulers of capitalist society, since, when they were formed, arms and training were given to the workers, who might decide to use them not against the foreign enemy but against the domestic rulers. Marxist theory, especially the Leninist branch of Marxism, naturally made a crucial point of this capitalist phenomenon, and in reality based revolutionary strategy upon it, the workers, armed in the mass by their rulers, were to turn their guns in the other direction. In modern times, up to the First World War, the infantry was the decisive branch of the armed forces. The weapons and maneuvers used by the infantry were comparatively simple, it took little skill or training to be able to learn them. Anybody can take his place in a mass infantry attack. Thus if the ordinary soldiers of the line, the armed workers, revolted, they could be expected to put up a perfectly adequate fight against the elements of the armed forces which failed to revolt. Beginning with the First World War, and carried vastly farther in the Second, this military situation has been radically altered. Mass infantry is not eliminated, yet at any rate. But victory is today seen to depend upon complicated mechanical devices, airplanes, tanks, and the rest, to produce and handle which requires, once more, considerable skill and training. The industrial worker cannot learn these overnight, and it is noteworthy that the members of the Air Corps and other highly mechanized branches of the armed forces are drawn scarcely at all from the ranks of the industrial workers. Just as the new techniques of industry weaken the general position of the workers in the productive process as a whole, so do the new techniques of warfare weaken the potential position of the workers in a revolutionary crisis. Street barricades and pike staffs, even plus muskets, are not enough against tanks and bombers. 5. The important social groups having as their professed aim the transition to socialism are the various Marxist political parties. Practical success for such parties does not at all guarantee the victory of socialism as the Russian experience shows. In general, there is no necessary correspondence between the professed aims of a political party and what happens when it takes power. But practical failure of these parties is additional, and strong, evidence against the prediction that socialism will come, since it removes one of the chief social forces which have been pointed to as motivation for the prediction. And the fact is that during the past two decades Marxist parties have collapsed on a world scale. Their fate can be pretty well summed up as follows, they have all either failed socialism or abandoned it, in most cases both. These parties, it should be recalled, comprised in their ranks and sympathizing circles, tens of millions of persons throughout the world. During the past 20 years, they have simply disappeared from existence in nation after nation. Wherever fascism has risen, and even, as in several Balkan nations, where fascism has not been conspicuously present, the Marxist parties have gone under, usually without even a fight for survival. The greatest of all Marxist movements, that of Germany, bowed to Hitler without raising a hand. Nor should we permit ourselves to be deluded by refugee Marxists who, whether to give themselves prestige, and an audience, or out of sincere self-deception, tell us about the vast underground movements. There is not the slightest real indication of the persistence of large organized underground movements. What has happened to the members of the Marxist parties is that many of them, particularly including many of the most vigorous, have been absorbed into the fascist movements, others have abandoned their hopes and become wholly passive, and, in any case, the new political techniques serve to atomize the remainder, as they do all opposition so that they cannot exist as an organized force and therefore cannot function seriously in the political arena, since only organized groups are of importance politically. But the physical elimination of many Marxist parties is not the only form of their collapse. Some apologists try to excuse Marxism by saying that it has never had a chance. This is far from the truth. Marxism and the Marxist parties have had dozens of chances. In Russia a Marxist party took power, Within a short time it abandoned socialism, if not in words at any rate in the effect of its actions. In most European nations there were, during the last months of the First World War and the years immediately thereafter, social crises which left a wide open door for the Marxist parties, without exception they proved unable to take and hold power. In a large number of countries, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Austria, England, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, France, the reformist Marxist parties have administered the governments, and have uniformly failed to introduce socialism or make any genuine step toward socialism, in fact, 
have acted in a manner scarcely distinguishable from ordinary liberal capitalist parties administering the government. The Trotskyist and other dissident opposition wings of Marxism have remained minute and ineffectual sects without any influence upon general political developments. The last distorted partial upsurge of the Marxist parties, in connection with the Popular Front movement, which was, in origin, simply a device of the Communist International for implementing one side of the Kremlin's foreign policy of the moment, shows a record of utter incompetence and weakness, France, and disastrous, no matter how heroic, defeat, Spain, and ended with a whimper at Munich. A detailed record of the Marxist party since 1914 would only emphasize and re-emphasize the impression that is obtained from the briefest of surveys. The general summary is, once again, that these parties have, in practice, at every crucial historical test, and there have been many, either failed socialism or abandoned it. This is the fact which neither the bitterest foe nor the most ardent friend of socialism can erase. This fact does not, as some think, prove anything about the moral quality of the socialist ideal. But it does constitute unblinkable evidence that, whatever its moral quality, socialism is not going to come. 6. The practical collapse of the Marxist parties has paralleled the collapse of the Marxist ideology. In the first place, the grander scientific pretensions of Marxism have been exploded by this century's increases in historical and anthropological knowledge and by the clearer contemporary understanding of the nature of scientific method. The Marxian philosophy of dialectical materialism takes its place with the other outmoded speculative metaphysics of the 19th century. The Marxian theory of universal history makes way for more painstaking, if less soul-satisfying, procedures in anthropological research. The laws of Marxian economics prove unable to deal concretely with contemporary economic phenomena. It would be wrong, of course, to deny all scientific value to Marx's own writings, on the contrary, we must continue to regard him as one of the most important figures in the historical development of the historical sciences, which sciences, even today however, are only in their infancy. But to suppose, as Marxists do, that Marx succeeded in stating the general laws of the world, of man and his history and ways, is today just ludicrous. The situation with Marxist ideology is the same as that with the leading capitalist ideologies. As we saw in connection with the latter, however, the scientific inadequacy of an ideology is not necessarily important. What is decisive is whether an ideology is still able to sway the hearts and minds of masses of men, and we know that this result does not have to have any particular relation to scientific adequacy. Nevertheless, in the case of Marxism more than in that of most other ideologies, though to some extent with all, the exposure of scientific inadequacy is itself a factor tending to decrease the mass appeal. Perhaps it is rather that scientific criticism doesn't really get to work until mass appeal begins to decline, for one of the big selling points of Marxism has been that it is the only scientific doctrine of society, and this has undoubtedly been a powerful emotional stimulant to its adherents. The power of an ideology has several dimensions, it is shown both by the number of men that it sways and also by the extent to which it sways them, that is, whether they are moved only to verbal protestations of loyalty, or to a will to sacrifice and die under its slogans. This power is tested particularly when an ideology, in reasonably equal combat, comes up against a rival. From all of these points of view the power of Marxist ideology, or rather of the strictly socialist aspects of Marxist ideology, has gravely declined. This is especially noticeable among that so decisive section of the population, the youth, who are no longer willing to die for the words of socialist ideology any more than for those of capitalist ideologies. The only branch of the Marxist ideology which still retains considerable attractive power is the Stalinist variant of Leninism, but Stalinism is no longer genuinely socialist. Just as in the case of the Stalinist party, the Marxist ideology has kept power only by ceasing to be socialist. An ideology, of course, does not gain great attractive power merely because of the words that are in it or the skill of those who propagate it. These factors cannot be disregarded, but an ideology is not able to make a widespread way among the masses unless, in however distorted and deceptive a form, it expresses actual needs and interests and hopes of the masses, and corresponds, at least in some measure, with the actual state of social conditions and possible directions of their development. The weakening of the attractive force of both capitalist and socialist ideologies is a result primarily of the fact that they no longer express convincingly those needs and interests and hopes, 
no longer correspond at all adequately to actual social conditions and the actual direction of social development. 7. The falsity of the belief that socialism is about to arrive has been shown by an analysis of the unjustified assumptions upon which that belief is usually based and by a review of specific evidence countering that belief. To these must be added, what has so far been only hinted at but what will occupy us largely in pages to come, the positive indications, already compelling, that not capitalism and not socialism but a quite different type of society is to be the outcome of the present period of social transition. Chapter 5. The Struggle for Power The general field of the science of politics is the struggle for social power among organized groups of men. It is advisable, before proceeding with a positive elaboration of the theory of the managerial revolution, to try to reach a certain clarity about the meaning of the struggle for power. The words which we use in talking about social groups are, many of them, taken over directly from use in connection with the activities of individuals. We speak of a group mind or group will or decision, of a war of defense, and similarly of a struggle among groups. We know, roughly at least, what we mean when we apply these words to individuals and their actions, but a moment's reflection should convince us that groups do not have minds or wills or make decisions in the same sense that applies to individuals. Defense for an individual usually means preventing some other individual from hitting him. Struggle means literal and direct physical encounter, and we can easily observe who wins such a struggle. But defense and struggle in the case of social groups, classes or nations or races or whatever the groups may be, are far more complicated matters. Such words are, when applied to groups, metaphors. This does not mean, as we are told by our popularizing semanticists who do not understand what semantics teaches, that we ought not use such words. It means only that we must be careful, that we must not take the metaphor as expressing a full identity, that we must relate our words to what actually happens. In all but the most primitive types of organized society, the instruments by which many of the goods, almost all of them nowadays, which are necessary for the maintenance and adornment of life are produced are technically social in character. That is, no individual produces, by himself, everything that he uses, in our society most people produce, by themselves, hardly anything. The production is a social process. In most types of society that we know about, and in all complex societies so far, there is a particular, and relatively small, group of men that controls the chief instruments of production, a control which is summed up legally in the concept of property right, though it is not the legal concept but the fact of control which concerns us. This control, property right, is never absolute, it is always subject to certain limitations or restrictions, as, for instance, against using the objects controlled to murder others at will, which vary in kind and degree. The crucial phases of this control seem to be two, first, the ability, either through personal strength, or, as in complex societies, with the backing, threatened or actual, of the state power acting through the police, courts, and armed forces to prevent access by others to the object controlled, owned, and, second, a preferential treatment in the distribution of the products of the objects controlled, owned. Where there is such a controlling group in society, a group which, as against the rest of society, has a greater measure of control over the access to the instruments of production and a preferential treatment in the distribution of the products of those instruments, we may speak of this group as the socially dominant or ruling class in that society. It is hard, indeed, to see what else could be meant by dominant or ruling class. Such a group has the power and privilege and wealth in the society, as against the remainder of society. It will be noted that this definition of a ruling class does not presuppose any particular kind of government or any particular legal form of property right, it rests upon the facts of control of access and preferential treatment, and can be investigated empirically. It may also be observed that the two chief factors in control, control of access and preferential treatment and distribution, are closely related in practice. Over any period of time, those who control access not unnaturally grant themselves preferential treatment and distribution, and contending groups trying to alter the relations of distribution can accomplish this only by getting control of access. In fact, since differences in distribution, income, are much easier to study than relations of control, those differences are usually the plainest evidence we have for discovering the relations of control. Put more simply, the easiest way to discover what the ruling group is in any society is usually to see what group gets the biggest incomes. Everyone knows this, 
but it is still necessary to make the analysis because of the fact that control of access is not the same thing as preferential treatment in income distribution. The group that has one also, normally, has the other, that is the general historical law. But for brief periods this need not invariably be the case, and we shall see later how significant the distinction is at the present time. In feudal society by far the major instrument of production was the land, feudal economy was overwhelmingly agricultural. De facto control of the land, with important restrictions, and preferential treatment in the distribution of its products were in the hands of the feudal lords, including the lords of the church, not of course as capitalist landlords but through the peculiar institutions of feudal property rights. These lords therefore constituted the ruling class in feudal society. So long as agriculture remained the chief sector of economy and so long as society upheld the feudal property rights, the lords remained the ruling class. The ruling class remained the same in structure, even though the individuals composing it might, and necessarily did, through death, marriage, ennoblement, and so on, change. Since the coercive institutions of the state, armed forces, courts, etc., in feudal society enforce these rights, we may properly speak of the medieval state as a feudal state. To an ever-increasing extent in post-medieval society, the decisive sectors of economy are not agricultural but mercantile, industrial, and financial. In modern society, the persons who control access to, and receive preferential treatment in, the distribution of the products of the instruments of production in these fields, and to a varying extent in the land also, are those whom we call capitalists, they constitute the class of the bourgeoisie. Their control is exercised in terms of the typical property rights recognized by modern society, with which we are all familiar. By our definition, the bourgeoisie or capitalists are the ruling class in modern society. Since the society recognizes these rights, we may properly speak of it as bourgeois or capitalist society. Since these rights have been enforced by the political institutions of modern society, by the state, we may speak similarly of the bourgeois or capitalist state. Once again, the existence of the bourgeois class does not depend upon the existence of any particular individuals, the individual members change. The existence of the class means only that there is in society a group exercising, in terms of these recognized bourgeois property institutions, a special degree of control over the access to the instruments of production, and receiving as a group preferential treatment in the distribution of the products of these instruments. What, let us ask, would be the situation in a classless society, a society organized along socialist lines? For society to be classless would mean that within society there would be no group, with the exception, perhaps, of temporary delegate bodies, freely elected by the community and subject always to recall, which would exercise, as a group, any special degree of control over access to the instruments of production, and no group receiving, as a group, preferential treatment and distribution. Somewhat more strictly on the latter point, there would be no group receiving by virtue of special economic or social relations preferential treatment and distribution, preferential treatment might be given to certain individuals on the basis of some non-economic factor, for example, ill persons might receive more medical aid than healthy persons, men doing heavy physical work more food than children or those with sedentary occupations, without violating economic classlessness. A new class rule in society would, in contrast, mean that society would become organized in such a way that a new group, defined in terms of economic or social relations differing from both feudal relations and bourgeois relations, would, as a group, in relation to the rest of the community, exercise a special degree of control over access to the instruments of production and receive preferential treatment in the distribution of the products of those instruments. What, then, is meant by the class struggle, the struggle for power? We say, often, that the bourgeoisie entered into a struggle for power with the feudal lords and, after a period, were victorious in that struggle. This is another of the metaphors drawn from personal combat and applied to group conflict we must examine in what sense the metaphor can be legitimately used. The inquiry, of course, is important for us, not in connection with the struggle for power of the past, but with the struggle today and tomorrow. It is certainly not the case that the capitalists of the world at some point got together, held a series of meetings, and came to the decision that they would embark upon a struggle for power against the feudal lords in order to organize society in such a manner as to be most beneficial to themselves, then went out and did battle against the assembled feudal lords, defeated them, 
and took over in person control of all the key institutions of society. Such behavior would presuppose a degree of consistency and scientific clarity that has been possessed by no class in history. In the first and most fundamental place, the successful struggle for power of the bourgeoisie against the feudal lords can be interpreted as simply a picturesque way of expressing the result of what did, in fact, actually happen, namely, in the Middle Ages society was organized in a way that made the feudal lords the ruling class, possessed of chief power and privilege, later on society was organized differently, in a way that made the bourgeoisie the ruling class. Under this interpretation, to say that today a certain social class, other than the bourgeoisie, is struggling for power and will win that struggle need mean no more than the prediction that in a comparatively short time society will be organized in a new and different manner which will place the class in question in the position of the ruling class, with chief power and privilege. This is part of what is meant hereafter in this book when I speak, in connection with the managerial revolution, of the manager's struggle for power. However, more than this is meant. Though the bourgeoisie did not act in the conscious and critical manner that is suggested by a too literal reading of the phrase, struggle for power, they certainly did do something, and not a little, to extend and consolidate their social domination. Though they were often far from clear about what they wanted out of history, they did not just sit back and let history take its own course. Two factors were of decisive importance in transforming society to a bourgeois structure a great deal of fighting and wars to break the physical power of the feudal lords, and the propagation on a mass scale of new ideologies suited to break the moral power of feudalism and to establish social attitudes favorable to the bourgeois structure of society. Now, the capitalists did not, in any considerable measure, do the actual fighting in the wars, nor themselves elaborate the new ideologies, but the capitalists financed those who did the fighting and the thinking. The actual fighting was done in the early centuries for the most part by armies of mercenary soldiers who, after the introduction of gunpowder, were more than a match for the feudal knights and their retainers, and, later on, especially in the great revolutions, by the non-bourgeois masses, the workers and poor peasants. The ideologies were for the most part worked out by intellectuals, writers and political theorists and philosophers, and by lawyers. Let us note, the hundreds of wars and civil wars fought from the 15th to the 18th century, by which time the social dominance of the bourgeoisie was assured in the major nations, were extremely various in character and motivation, from the point of view of the participants they were fought for religious, dynastic, territorial, commercial, imperial, and any number of other purposes. It is a gross perversion of history to hold that in them the bourgeoisie lined up on one side to fight feudal armies on the other. Indeed, even so far as more or less open class conflicts were concerned, the capitalists from the beginning were fighting each other as well as fighting against the feudal lords. But two facts about these wars are of special significance for us. First, that the net result in terms of alterations of the structure of society was to benefit, above all, the bourgeoisie, as against all other sections of society, and to leave the bourgeoisie ever more securely the ruling class in society. Second, the bulk of the actual fighters were not themselves capitalists. Presumably, at least where it was not a matter of direct compulsion, most of those who fought believed that they did so for ends which were beneficial to themselves, but, at least so far as economic and social benefit went, this turned out, for the non-bourgeois bulk of the fighters, either not to be the case at all or at least far secondary to the benefit resulting to the capitalists. Similar remarks apply to the development of the new ideologies. From the time of the Renaissance a number of more or less related new ideologies, religions, philosophies, moralities, theories of law and politics and society, were developed, and some of them became widely believed. None of these ideologies spoke openly in the name of the bourgeoisie, none of them said that the best kind of society and politics and morality and religion and universe was one in which the capitalists were the ruling class, they spoke, as all important ideologies do, in the name of truth and for the ostensible welfare of all mankind. But, as in the case of the wars, two facts are of special significance for us. First, that the net result of the widespread acceptance of some of these new ideologies was to promote patterns of attitude and feeling in society which benefited, above all, the social position of the bourgeoisie and the institutions favorable to the bourgeoisie. Second, belief in, and advocacy of, these ideologies were not at all confined to the bourgeoisie but spread to all sections of the population. Presumably, 
the non-bourgeois sections of the population believed because they thought that these ideologies expressed their interests and hopes and ideals. Judged in terms of economic and social results, this was either not the case at all or true for the non-bourgeois groups only to a very minor degree as compared with the capitalists. There was a general and a special phase in the development of bourgeois dominance. In general, the capitalists, starting from the small medieval towns and trading centers where primitive capitalist relations were already present at the height of the Middle Ages, gradually extended their dominance by reducing a greater and greater percentage of the widening economy to their control, that is, by bringing an ever greater percentage of trade and production within the structure of the capitalist form of economic relations, by making an ever greater percentage of the instruments of production the property of capitalists. This process continued an almost unbroken expansion until the First World War. Not only were already existing sectors of the economy shifted to a capitalist basis, as when an individual master craftsman with an apprentice or two changed himself into an employer by hiring employees for wages to work with his tools and materials at his workshop and for his profit, even more spectacularly did the capitalists expand the total area of the economy, the total of production, an expansion for which the capitalist economic relations were far better suited than the feudal. It must be stressed that the building of bourgeois dominance began and was carried far within feudalism, while the structure of society was predominantly feudal in character, while, in particular, the political, religious, and educational institutions were still controlled in the primary interests of the feudal lords. This was possible because society accorded the capitalists, at least to a sufficient extent, those rights necessary for carrying on capitalist enterprise, of contract, of taking interest, hiring free workers for wages, etc. in spite of the fact that most of these rights were directly forbidden by feudal law, custom, and philosophy, often, as in the case of taking interest, pious formulas were used to get around the prohibitions, and in spite of the fact that the wide extension of capitalist relations meant necessarily the destruction of the social dominance of the feudal lords. By the time the feudal lords, or some of them, woke up to what was happening and a threat to themselves, and tried to fight back, the battle was already just about over, for the bourgeoisie already controlled effectively the key bastions of society. If feudal society had refused from the beginning to recognize the bourgeois rights, the outcome might have been very different, but this is a useless speculation, since, in practice and in fact, these rights were, sufficiently, recognized. The fact that the bourgeoisie did build up their social dominance, did reduce ever-widening sectors of the economy to their control, within the still persisting framework of feudal society was, it would seem, a necessary condition for their appearing as the ruling class of the succeeding type of society. This point, in reverse, can reveal to us a decisive but neglected reason why socialism is not going to come. We have granted that, if socialism were going to come, the proletariat would have to be the social class chiefly concerned in its arrival. But the position of the proletariat in capitalist society is not at all the same as that of the bourgeoisie in late feudal society. The proletariat does not have a long period to build up gradually its social dominance, which means, above all, to extend control over greater and greater percentages of the instruments of production, a control expressed usually in the language of property rights. On the contrary, it does not have any such control, nor can it have in bourgeois society, or virtually none. Marxists have sometimes thought that the development of trade unions can make up for this deficiency. This is completely an illusion. Experience has proved that trade unions are not an anti-capitalist institution, not subversive of capitalist control over the instruments of production to any important or long-term extent, but are precisely capitalist institutions organized on the basis of, and presupposing, capitalist economic relations, a fact which is well known to most leading trade unionists. The proletariat, thus, has no established base, such as was possessed by the bourgeoisie, from which to go on to full social domination it does not have the social equipment for the fight. To return, however, to the bourgeoisie. I have spoken of this gradual extension of bourgeois control as the general phase of the development of bourgeois dominance. This was not enough to revolutionize the structure of society and to consolidate the position of the capitalists as the ruling class. So long as important institutions of society were dominated by the feudal lords and feudal ideas, the position of the capitalists was insecure and the possibilities of capitalist expansion were severely restricted. In particular was this true in the case of the political institutions of society, of the state, 
since the state comprises the coercive instrumentalities of society, charged with enforcing rights and obligations. A feudal state, to take obvious examples, might at any time, and often did, back the cancellation of debts with an appeal to the violated church doctrines against taking interest, might prevent serfs from leaving the land to seek work as free laborers, might permit the exaction of feudal dues on capitalist enterprises, and so on. Capitalism and the capitalists confronted the problem of state power. To assure their dominance and advance, the bourgeoisie had to take over state power. Here again we deal in a metaphor. What was needed for the development of capitalism and the dominance of the capitalists, and what in time, in fact, resulted, was a transformation in state institutions such that, instead of enforcing the rights and obligations of feudal society adjusted to the dominance of the feudal lords, they enforced the rights and obligations of capitalist society, adjusted to the dominance of the capitalists. In saying that the bourgeoisie took over state power and held it in England, France, the United States, or wherever it may have been, we do not necessarily mean that capitalists walked in physically or even that many government officials were drawn from the ranks of the capitalists. A bourgeois state, a state controlled by the bourgeoisie, means fundamentally a state which, by and large, most of the time and on the most important occasions, upholds those rights, those ways of acting and thinking, which are such as to permit the continued social dominance of the bourgeoisie. As a matter of fact, the transformation of the state institutions into integral parts of a capitalist society was a lengthy and complicated process, sometimes, but not always, including bitter civil wars as decisive steps. In the 15th and 16th and even the 17th centuries, the early capitalists, we know from the records of those times, worked closely with the princes or kings. The king in feudal society had been relatively unimportant, one feudal lord among others, often with less actual power than his chief vassals. When the kings began to strengthen their central authority and to try to build nations in the modern sense, their most obvious enemies were the feudal lords, including feudal lords who were supposed to be their own vassals. The kings sought support from the capitalists. The capitalists gave support to the kings because they, too, wanted stronger nations with national armies and navies to protect trade routes, and uniform laws, currencies, and taxes, so that trade could be carried on without constant interruption from a hundred feudal barons who considered themselves independent lords, because they made huge sums of money from dealings with the princes, and because they exacted protection and privileges in return for the aid they gave. In the wars and peace treaties, the elections of popes or emperors, the voyages of explorers and conquering armies during the 16th century, we always find a most prominent part played by the money of the Fuga or Medici or Welser or the other great merchant bankers of Augsburg or Antwerp or Lyons or Genoa. But the princes, too, could not be trusted in business matters, as many of these same great 16th century capitalists found to their bankruptcy and ruin. The de facto alliance between prince and capitalists was dissolved, and the prince was ousted, made a figurehead, or at the least restricted in the area a society over which his power extended. There were more wars and revolutions, and the ideal bourgeois state of the late 18th and 19th centuries emerged, political power vested in the lower house of a parliament with full assurance that the parliament was, by constitution, law, habit, custom, and belief, dedicated to the upholding of the structure of rights and obligations in terms of which society is organized as capitalist. One last observation in connection with the struggle for power of the bourgeoisie. Where did the early capitalists come from? They came from several sections of society, adventurers and brigands turned easily into capitalists after success in some escapade, artisans or master craftsmen became capitalists when they began to hire workers for wages, the biggest capitalists of the early period came from the ranks of the merchant shippers, who were, as we saw, a special group even in the Middle Ages proper. The point I wish to note is that in some, not a few, cases the capitalists came from the ranks of the old ruling class, from among the feudal lords themselves. Many of the feudal lords were killed off in the various wars, the family lines of many others died out or sank into impoverished obscurity. But some of them turned themselves into capitalists, by driving the serfs off their land and engaging in agriculture as capitalist landlords, by undertaking the capitalist exploitation of mines on their land, or by using for capitalist ventures gold or jewels or money that they had acquired. We must remember, for the future also, 
that for a ruling class to be eliminated from society in favor of another ruling class does not mean that all of its individual members and their families disappear. Some of them may be found, perhaps prominently found, economically and socially metamorphosed, in the ranks of the new ruling class. In describing the character of the present social transition and of the new type of society which is now developing, I shall continue to use the language of the struggle for power. I shall speak of the class of managers as fighting for power, in particular for state power, as having and propagating typical ideologies, and I shall speak of the managerial state and managerial society. I shall use this language because it is easy, well-known, and picturesque, but its metaphorical significance must not be overlooked. It covers social processes of the greatest complexity which I shall assume, as we always assume when we try to learn from experience, are not too dissimilar in general form to those of the struggle for power conducted by the bourgeoisie, which I have sketchily touched on in this chapter. Chapter 6. The Theory of the Managerial Revolution We are now in a position to state in a preliminary way the theory of the managerial revolution, the theory which provides the answer to our central problem. The theory holds, to begin with, that we are now in a period of social transition in the sense which has been explained, a period characterized, that is, by an unusually rapid rate of change of the most important economic, social, political, and cultural institutions of society. This transition is from the type of society which we have called capitalist or bourgeois to a type of society which we shall call managerial. This transition period may be expected to be short compared with the transition from feudal to capitalist society. It may be dated, somewhat arbitrarily, from the First World War, and may be expected to close, with the consolidation of the new type of society, by approximately 50 years from then, perhaps sooner. I shall now use the language of the struggle for power to outline the remaining key assertions of the theory. What is occurring in this transition is a drive for social dominance, for power and privilege, for the position of ruling class, by the social group or class of the managers, as I shall call them, reserving for the moment an explanation of whom this class includes. This drive will be successful. At the conclusion of the transition period the managers will, in fact, have achieved social dominance, will be the ruling class in society. This drive, moreover, is worldwide in extent, already well advanced in all nations, though at different levels of development in different nations. The economic framework in which this social dominance of the managers will be assured is based upon the state ownership of the major instruments of production. Within this framework there will be no direct property rights and the major instruments of production vested in individuals as individuals. How, then, it will be at once asked, and this is the key to the whole problem, if that is the economic framework, will the existence of a ruling class be possible? A ruling class, we have seen, means a group of persons who, by virtue of special social economic relations, exercises a special degree of control over access to the instruments of production and receives preferential treatment in the distribution of the product of these instruments. Capitalists were such a group precisely because they, as individuals, held property rights in the instruments of production. If, in managerial society, no individuals are to hold comparable property rights, how can any group of individuals constitute a ruling class? The answer is comparatively simple and, as already noted, not without historical analogues. The managers will exercise their control over the instruments of production and gain preference in the distribution of the products, not directly, through property rights vested in them as individuals, but indirectly, through their control of the state which in turn will own and control the instruments of production. The state, that is, the institutions which comprise the state, will, if we wish to put it that way, be the property of the managers and that will be quite enough to place them in the position of ruling class. The control of the state by the managers will be suitably guaranteed by appropriate political institutions, analogous to the guarantee of bourgeois dominance under capitalism by the bourgeois political institutions. The ideologies expressing the social role and interests and aspirations of the managers, like the great ideologies of the past an indispensable part of the struggle for power, have not yet been fully worked out, any more than were the bourgeois ideologies in the period of transition to capitalism. They are already approximated, however, from several different but similar directions, by, for example, Leninism-Stalinism, Fascism-Nazism, and, at a more primitive level, 
by New Dealism and such less influential American ideologies as technocracy. This, then, is the skeleton of the theory, expressed in the language of the struggle for power. It will be observed that the separate assertions are designed to cover the central phases involved in a social transition and in the characterization of a type of society which were discussed in chapters 1 and 2. But we must remember that the language of the struggle for power in metaphorical, no more than in the case of the capitalists, have the managers or their representatives ever got together to decide, deliberately and explicitly, that they were going to make a bid for world power. Nor will the bulk of those who have done, and will do, the fighting in the struggle be recruited from the ranks of the managers themselves, most of the fighters will be workers and youths who will doubtless, many of them, believe that they are fighting for ends of their own. Nor have the managers themselves been constructing and propagating their own ideologies, this has been, and is being, done for the most part by intellectuals, writers, philosophers. Most of these intellectuals are not in the least aware that the net social effect of the ideologies which they elaborate contributes to the power and privilege of the managers and to the building of a new structure of class rule in society. As in the past, the intellectuals believe that they are speaking in the name of truth and for the interests of all humanity. In short, the question whether the managers are conscious and critical, whether they, or some of them, set before themselves the goal of social dominance and take deliberate steps to reach that goal, this question, in spite of what seems to be implied by the language of the struggle for power, is not really at issue. In simplest terms, the theory of the managerial revolution asserts merely the following, modern society has been organized through a certain set of major economic, social, and political institutions which we call capitalist, and has exhibited certain major social beliefs or ideologies. Within this social structure we find that a particular group or class of persons, the capitalists or bourgeoisie, is the dominant or ruling class in the sense which has been defined. At the present time, these institutions and beliefs are undergoing a process of rapid transformation. The conclusion of this period of transformation, to be expected in the comparatively near future, will find society organized through a quite different set of major economic, social, add political institutions and exhibiting quite different major social beliefs or ideologies. Within the new social structure a different social group or class, the managers, will be the dominant or ruling class. If we put the theory in this latter way, we avoid the possible ambiguities of the overly picturesque language of the struggle for power metaphor. Nevertheless, just as in the case of the bourgeois revolution against feudalism, human beings are concerned in the social transformation, and, in particular, the role of the ruling class to be is by no means passive. Just what part, and how to liberate a part, they play, as well as the part of other persons and classes, bourgeois, proletarian, farmer, and the like, is a matter for specific inquiry. What they intend and want to do does not necessarily correspond with the actual effects of what they do say and do, though we are primarily concerned with the actual effects which will constitute the transformation of society to a managerial structure, we are also interested in what the various groups say and do. These remarks are necessary if we are to avoid common misunderstandings. Human beings, as individuals and in groups, try to achieve various goals, food, power, comfort, peace, privilege, security, freedom, and so on. They take steps which, as they see them, will aid in reaching the goal in question. Experience teaches us not merely that the goals are often not reached but that the effect of the steps taken is frequently toward a very different result from the goal which was originally held in mind and which motivated the taking of the steps in the first place. As Machiavelli pointed out in his History of Florence, the poor, enduring oppressive conditions, were always ready to answer the call for a fight for freedom, but the net result of each revolt was merely to establish a new tyranny. Many of the early capitalists sincerely fought for the freedom of individual conscience in relation to God, what they got as a result of the fighting was often a harsh and barren fundamentalism in theology but at the same time political power and economic privilege for themselves. So, today, we want to know what various persons and groups are thinking and doing, what they are thinking and doing has its effects on historical processes, but there is no obvious correspondence between the thoughts and the effects, and our central problem is to discover what the effects, in terms of social structure, will be. It should be noted, and it will be seen in some detail, that the theory of the managerial revolution is not merely predicting what may happen in a hypothetical future. The theory is, to begin with, 
an interpretation of what already has happened and is now happening. Its prediction is simply that the process which has started and which has already gone a very great distance will continue and reach completion. The managerial revolution is not just around the corner, that corner which seems never quite to be reached. The corner of the managerial revolution was turned some while ago. The revolution itself is not something we or our children have to wait for, we may, if we wish, observe its stages before our eyes. Just as we seldom realize that we are growing old until we are already old, so do the contemporary actors in a major social change seldom realize that society is changing until the change has already come. The old words and beliefs persist long after the social reality that gave them life has dried up. Our wisdom in social questions is almost always retrospective only. This is, or ought to be, a humiliating experience for human beings, if justice is beyond us, we would like at least to claim knowledge.